My name is uh, Michael Amundsen. I apologize, I will be speaking in English. It's a challenge enough in English for me, uh, but I appreciate you being here today. So I work with a company called Layer 7, it's a wonderful organization, and um, I go by many handles, many names. Uh, Hypermedia Junkie is a recent one because I speak so much and write so much and research so much on hypermedia, so much that I could fill a book. Um, but I, I have a really simple mission in my life, and that is to, to improve the quality and usability of information on the web. It's something that I do every single day. Not the quantity, not the speed, right? Not data, information, right? Information that we can use. And, and it's great because my job at Layer 7 is to help people build great web APIs. We're so proud to be uh, here at the beginning of this international conference. So I, I want to talk to you today. I actually want to challenge you today. I want to challenge you about this programmable world. And I wanted to do it by looking back. We have more than 50 years of modern computing history. 50 years of thinking about distributed systems. Do we remember this? How, have, how has this affected what we do today, how we see things today? Choices were made decades ago, and we accept them, or we change them. And what does this mean for what we will do in the future? So just some ideas, just some things to make us think. We here in this room will create the future. The future is based on the past. So I want to talk about some of these people. Some of these people you may recognize. Some of these people I have just met in the last few months. And I think they will, are thinking about and doing things that will affect all of us in really exciting and creative ways. So let's go back a bit. Vannevar Bush, working on the Manhattan Project in the United States to help build the first nuclear bomb. A huge project of brilliant minds all in a room, yelling at each other, talking with each other, remembering things. I read this, I read that, let's do this, let's do that. Vannevar recognizes that humans link to each other, that their brains jump from one idea to another. So he conceives in his mind, he's worried that once all of these brilliant people leave, that we will not have this link, we will not have this ability to learn so quickly from each other. So instead, what he, what he decides is he describes what he calls the Memex device in 1945, which now looks like sort of, we say, steampunk version of a computer, right? So it's this levers and knobs and tapes and reels, and everyone shares tapes, and you operate this with some strange buttons with lots of screens and a thing on your head, right? This is the future in 1945, right? This is space. But he realizes that we link together and that that we should be able to do that at distance rather than just simply close. So this is 1945, right? Here it is generations later and Google is actually building a Memex, are they not? This is wonderful. Mimic human linking using a machine. This is his idea. Jump ahead, there's a man called Ted Nelson who actually coins the phrase hypertext, hypermedia, hyperdata. He lives in California, he's a surfer. He has these weird ideas. He writes this book called Computer Lib Machine Dreams. He hand writes this book. Hand writes this book in the, in the 60s and 70s. And the book is great because it's actually two books. You read one side of it, you get to the middle and everything is upside down at the end. So you flip the book over and you read the other book. It's a brilliant, brilliant creative idea to make us think about how we use books. He said, if computers are the wave of the future, displays are the surfboards. It's because of him that we surf the web, because of Ted Nelson. Ted Nelson has done many, many things. This is one of the early drawings. Ted was trying to convince people that everything is linked together. We can actually do this. He describes how this works. He, has even, he is very concerned about the notion of using computers for education the wrong way. So one of his illustrations, is what was happening in the 70s about computer-assisted instruction, he says is all wrong. We have a mediator, we don't need a mediator, we don't need a wall. He wants to build a place where everything is consumed together. Student and subject are one thing. Ted Nelson describes exactly how those links can exist on a network. He builds on Vannevar Bush. 
describe how links work in a network, he does this. Now another very, very interesting person is Douglas Engelbart. Douglas Engelbart reads about the memex. Douglas Engelbart also reads quite a bit about the way people think and learn and the way brains work. And he develops the mouse. He develops the mouse that we all use today. The mouse that I use today, right? And he writes this long paper called Augmenting Human Intellect. His work is to augment the way our minds work, very similar to, to uh, the way Bush talks about it. This is actually one of the earliest mouse pointing devices. You can see two rollers in a wooden box connected by these wires. And this is what he builds in 1968 called NLS or the online system. Think about it, 1968, we haven't even landed on the moon yet. And he has built a machine where by manipulating a few keys and this mouse, you can change what appears on the tube, right? So he has built the Memex in just a matter of less than 20 years, 20 years almost, right? So he has done this. So these are the people who built what we work on today. In the, in the space of just one generation, he built the hardware that made that linking network possible. Describe human linking. Uh, mim uh, mimic with a machine. Describe how it would work on a network and then make that possible in 20 years, in one generation. There are so many other things I could tell you about these three people, but I have so little time. Look these people up. Um, there's a wonderful video of Engelbart demonstrating his mouse device. It's a small video you can find. If you Engelbart mouse, uh, I think, video or something, or online systems. The mother of all demos. Is what is it? The mother of all demos. Yes, 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 exactly. Yes. So how does that affect us? Right? So what does that result in, and who builds on these things? So I'm going to shift gears. Christopher Alexander, in the 60s and the 70s, is, is a physical architect, and he writes this book, The Timeless Way of Building. And in this book, he describes his discovery that buildings that are thousands of years old are still wonderful places to be, used for purposes they were never originally designed, but yet comfortable. Why is this? Why is it that over thousands and thousands of years, all these buildings, the, they're still useful and they still exist, and others are just crap? And he settles on this notion that there, are, there is a pattern. There's a pattern to an entryway. There's a pattern to a window. There's a pattern to a garden. These all exist for a reason. And everyone recognizes these patterns. Everyone. You don't need to be a technician to do this. Everyone can contribute. So he, he builds this notion of patterns and talks about, this is, for, this is from one of his displays, called uh, an article called, The City is Not a Tree. So many of us think of computer systems in trees, right? We, we all are, a lot of our software, a lot of our visualization are in trees. He says, no, they're not trees, they're lattices. Everything is connected to everything. So here he is in architecture, talking about how things interconnect. The same things that were talked about a generation ago about information, right? And he also notices that if you look in the way cities are arranged or communities are arranged, there are nodes, there are pieces, there are connections together and there are little pathways, and we should pay attention to the pathways. It's because of Christopher Alexander we have this phrase, uh, what do we say, pave the cow path? Do we know this phrase? Wait and see where people go, see what parts of the system people use, create supportive structure around that part. Don't create the roadways first. Create the roadways after we see where people go, what their patterns are. And this affects, uh, for instance, this is the primary idea behind the IETF, the Internet Engineering Foundation, is this notion that we should pave the cow paths, follow what people want to do. So he identifies patterns for thinking and acting that he says work for thousands and thousands of years. Patterns. The pattern movement in software goes directly to Christopher's work, to Alexander's work. About the same time that Alexander is talking about patterns in the way we act and think, it's a wonderful, wonderful book. The Design of Everyday Things. Originally, it was called The Philosophy of Everyday Things. And Donald Norman uh, uh, uses all this information about the way we interact with the world, what, uh, what Gibson calls affordances. This, this affords uh, resting something on. I could stand on it if I was, if I was really crazy. 
right? It affords all sorts of things. So these affordances exist around us every day. And he develops several things in this book. One of the ones that I really love is this notion of the action life cycle, the seven stages of action. He says, we all interact with the world in the exact same way. All animals, all creatures interact in the world in the same way. Because of his thinking about interaction and what's usable and what's not and what, what affordances do and don't do, he becomes really the father of human computer interaction thinking. So here we are in the late, uh, late 80s. He is talking about this. Part of his book, this huge part of his book, illustrates the way we use the affordance of doorways. We know, yes, right? There's a handle, I pull. There's a bar, I push. Ah, but some doors lie. Right? We all know this, right? So we go pull the handle, it doesn't work, and then we feel foolish. No, no, we're not foolish. That's a bad door. Right? And so Norman gets us to think about how we carry in our head certain expectations and that we should craft items, industrial furniture, artwork, user interfaces, to match those things that we carry in our head. So in the head and in the world is very important to Norman. So very much like Alexander, Norman's talking about how we interact in the world. Here's, here's a picture of his, his uh, life cycle, and he has this beautiful idea, the, the gulf of execution and the gulf of evaluation. We, we, decide, we, we decide we want to do something. We formulate a goal and a plan in our head. We figure out which thing we're going to do next. And we do something, and then we see what happens. We evaluate the results. We, we decide, uh, what does that mean? And say, am I done, or should I do something else? Right? This is how the world works. But how many of us write our code this way? Most of us write our code from start to finish. The one big group of people who write code this way Gamers, because they're mimicking the world, right? This is the way code should work. This is the way the web should work. Uh, many times in, uh, in his book, he refers to, and even the cover is decorated by Jacques Carreman's uh, uh, ob Objects Not Found, Unfindable Objects. Crazy notion. This is a fantastic project by an artist here in, uh, in France. It, he creates detailed drawings of wonderfully, exquisitely crafted items that are useless, right? How many of us work in software on excellently crafted items that no one wants to use? Ah. Right, so identify this cycle that we use for interaction. So now we have these patterns, right, from this architect. We have this notion of, of the way we interact with this world from this, uh, this usability consultant. These all affect what we do today. And then I have to mention one of my pals, one of my friends, one of the people I really enjoy. Roy Fielding finishes his PhD dissertation on how to design networked software systems. Most people think his dissertation about, is about this thing called REST. No. No. REST was just the proof of his theory, of his idea that we should be designing systems. We should be designing distributed information systems based on this notion of, of how they interact with each other. It's large systems. He's not talking about writing software. He's talking about inventing large, large systems. And I, I won't go through the details, but he has this wonderful quote that I love about how what we transfer and what we perceive is never the thing. Right? We only perceive a representation, what our eyes can see at a distance. I might see something different than you. And if I see you tomorrow, are you the same person or are you different tomorrow? Right? We have this notion of identity that we carry with us, but actually it's represented differently every day. I have a little puppy. It grows into a dog. It grows into an old pal. I keep calling it the same name. That's not the same puppy. right? It's just a representation that I have that I apply identity to all the time. And HTTP has actually built on this notion of representations, right? We don't send you the object. We send you a representation of that object. He builds an entire system based on this notion. This is a, w a wonderful little reduction of his notion of about how to design a system that follows these rules of representation and state transfer. I like it not, not because it's so easy to understand, but because it's so simply drawn. He incorporates so many things here about different existing systems and how you pick and choose to create an interaction model in and in an environment that you wish to have, which happens to be the one that he wishes over there. But his whole paper is about creating 
environments, creating systems of interaction. How many of us create systems of interaction? Most of us simply write code, right, for this one system. He's very disappointed. He had hoped that he had taught us how we could build more systems like this. Here he is explaining not, not just the model, right? This is, this is the model. He has another wonderful idea. There's a model, but then there's the thing. There's the implementation, right? So how we implement, how things interconnect with each other. Going to the, it's not really important that we know what each of those squares are, but the idea that things are interconnected. How much this looks like the cow paths, right? In fact, Fielding quotes Alexander at the end of his dissertation about building the timeless way. Fielding was very much aware of this. Fielding even talks about affordances and usability and making information usable using the same words that Donald Norman uses. So here we are to the last decade, right? To the beginning of the century. Now we have all of these materials built up for us. He's created this, this way for, for creating models to create new systems, new systems based on this interconnectivity, based on these, these parts, based on this structure of patterns. So this is a, this is a fantastic generation. Right? They've, they've given us, this is what we use today, right? These are the things we do today. Usability studies, testing, the web, HTTP, these are all the things that we use every day, we want, we expect to happen, right? But these were designed decades ago. We need, we need more. We need new things. We need new ideas. So I want to talk about uh, a few things. This is, this is where it gets scary, right? Because, okay, it's really easy for me to talk about all those things that are 20 years old, 30 years, 40 years old. I want to introduce you to some new people. People that I think are doing really incredible things that will affect all of us when we build our enterprise, when we build our APIs, when we create that experience that we were, that we were talking about earlier today, about how I'm using APIs, right? Interfaces, right? So I'm going to break a rule. The first thing I'm going to talk about is not a person. Because I think this is an incredible change in the way we interact. Git invented by Linus Torvalds, a, a distributed source control management tool. But I also want to talk about GitHub. GitHub builds on Linus idea and makes coding social. Coding social. So first, Linus makes source code a lattice, right? Just like Alexander had talked about, right? But GitHub makes it interaction and creates an interactive space uh, like uh, Norman had talked about. So um, I, I love this quote. It doesn't really relate, but I, I wanted to point it out. Bad programmers worry about code. Good programmers worry about data structures and their relationships. I'm pretty sure he means the data relationships, right? Not the person relationships. Programmers may not be so good at relationships. Maybe. But I love this idea. I love that code now. I can interact, right? So I'm linked. I'm linked. This is so much like what Vannevar Bush wants to do, right? Now, not only do I have ideas that are linked to other people, I can see their changes right away, and they can make changes, and they can improve on what I do. An excellent part of the open source movement, of the open source concept, is this notion that lots and lots of eyes mean that we can find lots and lots of mistakes and fix them quickly, right? GitHub makes this possible. GitHub enables this in a, in a really important way. I also love this picture. This is usually when you're trying to explain a Linux distributed control system to someone, you show this picture and it's like lines and, and you know, blows people's minds away when you try to explain to them how distributed version control system works. Why? Because distributed version control is not a tree. A city is not a tree and neither is code, right? So it's wonderful that they're all interconnected in ways. So it gets even worse, right? So even the explanation of the physics, right? We have to say, oh, no, no, there's a, there's a, there's a reproduction of, of the code in lots and lots of places. There is no one central place. No, 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 wait a minute, you say in the enterprise. No, no, there has to be one. No. There are lots and lots of copies that have the same identity, right? 
So we've heard this before, right? We've heard this idea that, like as Fielding would say, they're just representations of the code, and everyone has one, and everyone can contribute. And again, when you look at this notion about how distributed version control works, and Alexander's nodes, and Fielding's construction of how to, how to design networks, they look so similar because they draw on the same ideas. The same ideas, but they apply them to different things. Now we're actually applying them to the code, to the bits. And we're doing code. Why aren't we doing language? Why aren't we doing novels? Why aren't we doing uh, programming? Why aren't we doing uh, media, right? All these things can work in this distributed way. All this is yet to be done. Enable collaborative interaction at distances of both time and space. This can sit for weeks and weeks and weeks and someone can contribute. And I can leave a note and someone else sees it tomorrow. So I can be separated not just by distance. You know, me in the US and you here in Paris. No. We separated by time. Remember that thing last year? Oh yes, it's on GitHub. I will get it. It's fantastic. Space and time collapse. Okay, I want to talk about Ryan Dahl. We know this? Node JS? Node? I love the idea behind this. I don't know that Node itself is a coding language that we will talk about generations from now, but I think the idea that he has come up with is brilliant. The more and more distributed we get, the more and more latency, the more and more wait time we have in a system, right? We have to communicate. I can only, it's like, I don't know, the physical properties of going around the world, you know, what is that, 20 milliseconds or something, you 10 milliseconds. You can't get any faster than that, right, right now. So he decides to build a system that makes that a feature, not a bug. Let's design a system where we can use that latency to do other things. Right? So for lots of other reasons, he decides to use JavaScript as the front end because there's some free collaborative software that, that Google has produced that makes this easy. But it could be done in anything. You could, could have invented a new language. But he's smart. He says, I don't have time for that. I'm just going to take a language that we have. I love, I love this. It's more like C than Python, and that's by design. This Isaac is, is now the, the prime committer to Node. Many people think it, it looks like JavaScript, so they think, oh, it's like JavaScript. No, 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 no. That's just the paint, right? This is the face. The interaction is this notion of creating code pieces that will run when they're necessary, not creating this big, simple top-down structure, or this first-to-last but creating pieces and creating listeners and say, yes, when this happens, do this now. Right? So it's a very interactive system. This is the site. If you haven't, haven't installed or played with Node, I suggest you do it. It's very interesting. The Node idea is very simple. I thought I would include this. <coughs> I.O., input, output, you're doing it wrong. If you're waiting, Ryan says, you're doing it wrong. We shouldn't have to wait. We have this fantastic world network. Why are you waiting for a server to answer you? Or simply, do not block. Write code that doesn't wait, that doesn't block, that doesn't force someone to do something sequentially. And to do it, he implements a pattern, a pattern that we've known for more than a generation, the patterns that were spurred on by Christopher Alexander. And this pattern is called the reactor pattern. Wait for events. When events happen, handle them. Make changes to the state machine. Wait for more events. Simply wait, simply wait, simply wait. Wait and do, wait and do. It's a simple, simple, simple idea. It doesn't matter that he writes it in C in the base and it's JavaScript on the top. It doesn't matter. What matters is he's created this loop and how familiar this loop looks. All right? So he's taking these ideas and he's building a, a coding system based on that same notion about the gulf of evaluation and execution. What's he done? Is he's, he's improved the gulf of evaluation. He's shortened it, right? Execution's easy. We can write code that runs very fast. When it codes and what it does and when it reacts is important. That's what he's focused on. I think this idea is very, very important. Gamers have been doing this for a long time. Ryan's work makes it possible for us in business to start to do the same thing. Embrace latency as a feature in a network. We will have latency. Let's use it. Don't complain about it. Don't try to write code. Don't try to hide it. Don't try to add more servers, right? Oh, it'll be better. We'll just scale up. No, no, no. It's part of the system, right? Okay, I want to talk about Rich Hickey. Rich is a wonderful, brilliant mind. Um, creates the language called Clojure. 
which is very similar in many ways to Ryan's work. But also the thing that I'm most impressed with right now is this project called Datomic, a new way to think about data. Code is data. Does this sound familiar? Linus said, right? Good programmers worry about the data, not the code. He says, ah, they're the same. Even better, I love this idea, the past doesn't change, right? So I store like today's weather in a, in a box called today's weather. And you come by tomorrow and you look inside that box. What's in there? Is it what I put in there yesterday? Is that what I put in there today? Is that the same thing? No, no, the past never changes. His idea is brilliant. We have to start thinking of data as simply lots and lots of copies, each with a shared identity. The value at some place, not the value. This is exactly what, what Fielding was talking about, about representations. When I have a puppy and when I, my dog grows up, that's all the same thing. We, it's all, they're different items, but we use the same identity. He's building data storage based on this idea. This is the website. It's a very, very interesting project. Even if you're not a developer, even if you're not a programmer, reading this and thinking about this is excellent. I had a terrible time coming up with visuals for this one. How do I show this? So what I did is I actually picked a project that he's working on called Codec, where he's trying to turn Git into a usable, uh, queryable source. I love the idea that he's using Git, although we've just talked about Git. So he treats repositories not like individual items, but as the same identity with different values through time. And by doing so, we can create all sorts of query tools now that, we, that are focused on time. I, I didn't even get to talk about a, a, a project that I really like that, that deals with time. There's, there's someone who has a specification to mark every representation on the internet with a timestamp so that we can query that same address and get all of the collections at that identity, all of the stored data at that one location. Think of what we can do when we learn to think of the world as a time series rather than some bucket that changed because the past doesn't change. And again, I love how his idea about how to uh, arrange these Git repositories looks so similar to the, the illustrations of Git itself. Again, it's not a tree. So recognize that every bit of data is immutable. What I just said a moment ago is not going to change. It's there. And we just have lots of copies with shared identity. All right, I want to talk about one more person. I just met him a few months ago, and I was completely blown away by Eric's work. Eric is an architecture uh, PhD student and left architecture because he was frustrated. And he designs these things called cubelets, which are these brilliant notions, these tiny little things that do just one thing. And he gives them to children. He's corrupting our youth with this notion uh, of programming without writing any code. Because what he's done is created all these simple devices that do just one thing and one thing well, the Unix way. Do one thing, do one thing well, communicate. Uh, to each other in text was uh, McElroy's original idea. There's a battery. There's a thing that senses brightness and heat. There are things that rotate and they sense distance. And you construct them. They're very simply built, each one of them cheaply built, very simple because they do just one thing and do an output and accept an input. And you can build all sorts of fantastic devices simply by, they run by magnets, simply by placing them together. And what he's teaching them looks so much, if you look at all these components, it looks so much like Fielding's notion of a network. All these things that could be coupled and decoupled and entered. He's built this. And he's built it so that our children can create networks, create systems, and get emergent behavior. I don't know what's going to happen when we put them this way. Let's find out. This is the way life works. All right? Let's find out. That's not how we, we usually script, uh, life is not scripted. We'd love it, right? It's a great story if we could. So embrace latency, recognize that data is immutable. Create systems that, that allow for emergent behaviors and properties. These are the ideas that I think are gonna change what we do in the next 20 years. Our interfaces need to take these into account. If we simply copy what we've done in the past, we have a problem. All right, I'm running out of time. I wanna, I wanna just go through these last few bits. So what does the future hold? Will we continue to do things imperatively? Or will we embrace the notion that it's, it's an environment, a system, a lattice work, not a top-down? 
We continue, will we continue to run our organizations as if there's central control? Will we continue that fiction? Oh, I'm being told I'm done. Will we build bigger and bigger machines or we, will we leverage these small tiny units? Let me tell you what I'd like to see. The kind of thing that I would like to use and what I would like to work with. What I would like to help build. Systems composed of many small independent units. All based on a pattern. Able to bridge this gulf of execution and evaluation, not because they're so smart, but because they're so small, because the gulf is so tiny. Widely distributed, they exist everywhere. There is no one piece of software, there are pieces. Able to work in a collaborative way as a collective. Whether it's humans or bits of software, we can do this. We have all this material now. All to continue to augment human intellect. To continue to advance how we interact with each other, the things we think about, and the things we do. But there is no single future. The choice is ours. Who is the next person in my list? I'd like to think it's someone in this room. <laughs> eh? Thank you very, very much. Thank you.